Welcome to On Texas Football Sunday Night Live Stream. I'm Bobby Burton. Happy St. Patrick's Day, everybody. I'm the only one wearing green here. Uh, but hey, uh, we're going to talk a little Longhorn football, a little Longhorn basketball. Uh, the Longhorns, a seven seed uh, baseball team, almost took it on the chin, almost got swept this week uh, from uh, by the University of Washington. And then uh, a couple of good news things. Uh, Lance Jackson, a recruit out of Texarkana, Pleasant Grove, Jerry and, uh, and uh, Rod. It sounds like he might end up being a five-star after what he did uh, today at the uh, at the uh, Under Armour Combine down in Houston. Uh, mm -hmm. Finally, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about some other guys that Jerry talked to uh, at the event. Uh, and then also Scotty Scheffler. Congratulations to him. He wins the Players' Championship. Uh, eight under today he came back from he came screaming back uh, it was like uh rod babers running in the 40 yeah uh, on that one. <laughs> let's, let's start with the longboard basketball team i'm going to check to you jerry uh, a seven seed kind of high based on what we thought huh well you know because the metric said seven seed we've been talking about it on on texasfootball.com then the Texas is NCA dot uh, in, NCA net ranking was always inside 30 after they won at Texas Tech and they had that strong close to the regular season. They were sitting inside 30 fluctuating between 25 and 29 30. So they were right there on that seven seed line. And we kind of been talking about that I, after the loss to Kansas State. I wasn't sure they'd get the nod necessarily. But if you look at it, they had, they had five quad one wins. Right. They had four big 12 road wins. Um, so they kind of had that metric to be a seven seed team. Do I think they're a seven seed team? I don't really know. I mean, look, you, you can throw all these guys up in this tournament this year. It's going to be a wild tournament. I, I think there's going to be upsets everywhere in this tournament. Um, but I, 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 one thing is, is Texas a seven seed as an offensive basketball team? They dang sure are. If Max Asmus and Dylan DeSue play well, uh, they, they can win a game and challenge Tennessee. Uh, in the second round of the tournament. Um, I'm not sure Tennessee's a great matchup for Texas if they get there. And by the way, I'm not sure if either coach will call a timeout in that game if they both get there. Uh, but, uh, um, mm. I, I, you know, Virginia, Colorado State's interesting because you'd probably rather play Colorado State from a tempo standpoint. Um, you get in a game against Virginia, and if they get you in that slowest tempo in college basketball and you're not making threes, you will lose that game. That mm. That's the key. If they can get you in that slow tempo and they're in that game and you start missing threes, if you have an off night from the from the field, you will lose in Charlotte to Virginia. Um, mm -hmm. I think Colorado State's probably the better matchup for Texas. Um, but, you know, look, they're in the tournament as a seven seed. They're playing a 10 seed. That Virginia-Colorado State game will be played Tuesday night in Dayton. That'll be on True TV. Those teams will board a flight, head to Charlotte, day of prep, play Texas on Thursday. Probably be a late game, obviously, coming off a uh, – uh, having to play the Tuesday game. But I think Texas has a more favorable matchup against Colorado State than Virginia. I think they'll obviously be favored in either one of those games. Um, neither one of them is a gimme. Uh, Colorado State and Texas have only played one common opponent this year. That was Wyoming. Colorado State split with Wyoming in conference play. Texas beat Wyoming 86-63 early in the season without Dylan DeSue in Austin. Obviously, Wyoming is a little different team later in the year. Yeah, I want to ask you some more questions before I do that. Uh, I, I want to and about the tournament as a whole. Before I do that, I want to say thank you to our newest sponsor. Our newest sponsor is Joe Brown. Special thanks to him. He's your veteran mortgage professional. Uh, Joe has been providing mortgages in Austin and around Texas for more than three decades. In fact, he was my mortgage broker for my very first ever home purchase more than 25 years ago. Joe's also a proud Navy veteran, a devout Longhorn fan, has two degrees, uh, by the way, uh, from, uh, from the University of Texas. Give him a call, 512-663-4744. If you're looking for a mortgage, he has experience. No one else can, or very few can match with that amount of time in the business. That's 512-663-4744. He's also worked with various University of Texas athletes over the years uh, as well. Thank you, Joe, for your sponsorship. Uh, Rod, what were your immediate takeaways from the uh, uh, from what you saw of the uh, announcement uh, today with the NCAA attorney? Uh, yeah, it was a it was a little higher than I thought they they uh, they'd get. Honestly, I thought uh, the projections I thought had them around an eight or a nine seed somewhere around there. I mean, 
probably more like a nine seed, but it's good for the Longhorns with the seven seed. I mean, it probably shows you more respect for the Big 12 schedule uh, and how it yeah. lays. I mean, the Big 12 is the toughest conference, basketball conference in the country, and it's not even close. Uh, so the hope is that this is a battle-tested Texas basketball team. Um, I think it's up – I mean, if, if Tyrese Hunter and Max Aceman play well, Dylan DeSue is a constant. I mean, he's out there. He's going to play well. You know what he's going to give you. I mean, that's, he's pretty much the identity of the team. Um, if Max Aceman and Tyrese Hunter play well, if you get good guard play – to me, that's the key for Texas winning winning a game and potentially even making a run. If they get good guard play, consistent guard play, they haven't really had that all season long. Both Max Aismas and Tyrese Hunter playing well, uh, in addition to Dylan Dessou. So to me, that's kind of the key for them and, and a fast start. And I don't like them getting behind. You know, I don't like this is a team that has to play from behind. I don't like that. I, when they have a fast start, too, I say that, and then they just gave up a big lead and lost the game. So, uh, but they that, but it, I think ultimately it comes down to guard play, like it always does in the tournament. If Tyrese Hunter and Max Aceman play well, we we know what we're gonna get from Dylan Dessou. Dylan Dessou is, like I said, he he's basically the identity of the team at times. But what they need is uh, a supporting cast, pretty much for Dylan Dessou, and we haven't had a consistent supporting cast for Texas. I, I, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna back. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna follow up on that real quick, Bobby. That. It's all about Tyrese Hunter to me. Look, I mean, teams are going to get the ball out of Max's hands. He's ha he's had a really good season, but when the team gets the ball out of his hands, mm -hmm. Tyrese Hunter has to play well. Tyrese Hunter goes from a career-high 30 against OU to zero field goals made against Kansas State. And I hate to keep crushing Tyrese Hunter, but this is why it's so important right now for Texas. And there are three games this year in losses. Um that was, um, oh gosh, I'm losing Marquette on the road, Iowa State at home, Kansas State neutral. He was, o Tyrese was 0 for 21 combined in those three games. A guy that started 104 games was a one time Big 12 freshman of the year, had three 0 for games from the field. Whatever, t which Tyrese Hunter shows up is going to tell the story for Texas. Because Texas is good. I'm telling you, Texas is good enough to get to a Sweet 16. Dylan, DeSue, and Ace Smith are going to play well. They have experience. They're going to play well enough. If Hunter plays well behind them for two games in a row, they mm -hmm. can beat Tennessee. It's not out of the question. I mean, Rick Barnes has a good team. It's not his normal bully team. They're a little bit more guard-oriented, shoot the three more. Uh, Dalton connects a really good athlete uh, at the wing. Ziegler's very quick at point guard. So this isn't the Tennessee team that went and bully balled Duke last year in that second round game. It's a different Tennessee team. Now, Rick will bully Tech, try to bully Texas around. But if Hunter plays well, Texas is really, really good on offense. Um, and that's the one thing about this team that hadn't changed. I mean, so if he plays well, uh, they have a chance. Now, I'll say this. I want Texas has been a seven seed four times since 1999. That's when Rick Barnes got there. Texas is 3-1 and one in 7-10 games. The only loss was Rick's first year in 99-00. They lost to Purdue, 58-54. Then in 08-09, they beat Minnesota. Uh, that was AJ, AJ Abrams had a big game against Minnesota. Then they lost to number two seed Duke. At 13-14, they beat Arizona State, 87-85. Cam Ridley had a really good game. They lost to two seed Michigan, who was really good that year. I mean, they got blown out in that game. And then uh, two years ago, Chris Beard's only season in Austin. Uh, Texas was a seven seed. And beat Virginia Tech uh, 81-73 and then lost a two-seed Purdue 81-71. So Texas has never, as a seven-seed, advanced to the Sweet 16, in the la or never, in the last 25 years. And Texas has never been to back-to-back -back Elite Eights before either. So just something to know there. And so um, just, just, just a couple of facts there headed into the tournament. I, I would say this, the interesting thing, you, that second-round game, Jerry, that you mentioned, it, it's vir virtually a Tennessee home game. Oh, yeah. Um, because big time. Is just over the mountains uh, yes. from uh, Charlotte. I mean, literally, yeah. you go over the Appalachians mm. or the Rocky Mountain, or the uh, uh, Smoky Mountains, and you're there in Charlotte. And, and Virginia, uh, Virginia is as well. That, I, that's one of the reasons I'd rather play Colorado State. Honestly, I mean, Virginia is a home game too. It's an ACC home game. Yeah. Well, and everybody what, already hates Texas, so <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, your your point about Tyrese Hunter, though, is just, I mean, he is what he is, and, and that's inconsistent. I mean. Yeah, I used to say this about Texas quarter quarterback play for between Colt McCoy and and Sam Ellinger, it was consistently inconsistent. That's you could, <laughs> you could rely on it being inconsistent. It could, I mean, Tyrone Swoops against Iowa State. What he 
hit 18 in a row or something and then go two of 10 the next game, you know, yeah. you know, so, uh, Tyrese Hunter is consistently inconsistent. Yes. And the highs are the highs and the lows are the lows. And so relying on people like that when all the chips are on the table, typically not a good thing. Typically. Yeah. Doesn't Agreed. mean they can't hit it, though. Doesn't mean they can't hit it. I, I do want to add this. If they get uh, Virginia, obviously, it's a rematch for Caden Shedrick's old yeah. team, uh, the, the forward center slash player for the University of Texas. Uh, that came in and has played for them this year. Or if they get Colorado State, think about this. Longhorn football team and basketball team could be playing Colorado State in this in this calendar year. Because the Longhorns yeah, have the uh, Rams in uh, regular season in football, uh, preseason. Colorado oh, State. That's cool. Yeah, Colorado State's best guard is from Allen High School in Texas as well. Was part of a really good team in Allen. They have another guard, I think their third guard. Uh, the first guard off the bench is from Waxahachie. Uh, so a couple of DFW area guards there. And anybody knows guards in DFW, man, they can go. Uh, so Colorado State obviously recruits Texas in, in hoops. Um, tough conference they're coming out of. I mean, they're ready. Colorado State was in the tournament two years ago, lost in the first round. So they have a couple of guys. Obviously, these teams that get in, they're all seniors. Four, four-year yeah. guys, five-year yeah. guys, and a lot of transfers. Colorado State has, a, probably, I think, three guys that were on that team that lost in a tournament. So they're not without success, but that's the other thing with Texas, man. I mean, here's the thing. Tyrese Hunter's played in two sweet 16s and an elite eight. Dylan Mitchell's played in a sweet, two uh, sweet 16 and elite eight, right? Brock Cunningham has now been to sweet 16 and elite eight. I mean, so Max Acemas has played in the sweet 16 game. Caden Shedrick's playing the NCAA tournament. Texas has a ton. Dylan DeSue, obviously he didn't get to play in the sweet 16 elite eight because he was hurt, but, these guys have a lot of NCAA tournament experience. That's the one thing Texas has going for them. If they can't put it together, if Tyrese can't just find some a little consistency for a week or so here, um, man, that's going to be a tough one for Texas because this is an experienced team in the NCAA tournament with really good offensive players. Uh, Texas plays 550 on Thursday afternoon, by the way. Uh, is so, that out now? Yep, it's out now. And so uh, CJ just texted us all. CJ actually will be joining us this Second half of this hour, Jerry's got to get on a plane uh, to come back home. Uh, so he'll, CJ Vogel will be joining us. Uh, Rod and I will be here uh, for the remainder of the hour as well. We'll talk a little bit more basketball. We'll talk about football next. That's going to be what I've got circled next. Rod Babers, two days away, baby. Uh, boy, baby. From spring football, Longhorns take to the practice field. Uh, Denius Fields at uh, 9 o'clock on Tuesday morning. You've been through these personally. You're just coming back. These these guys, all the players are just coming back from spring break. You're hoping they didn't party too hard, right? But hopefully they all got back tonight, go to school tomorrow, then up early uh, for practice on Tuesday morning. What are your thoughts on uh, uh, the Longhorns and their first spring practice of 2024? Yeah, it is interesting. Uh, Jerry and I were talking about this, um, and CJ as well, the new – era of NIL, these guys, you know, they, they have different spring breaks yes. than we had back in the day. Uh, they're more exotic, right? a little bit more lavish than we had <laughs> back in the day. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I stayed around the state of Texas most of the time. I mean, I was either in H town or I was probably just stayed in Austin. Um, so that was pretty much, you know, my spring break and it, you know, because of my circumstances, I was pretty much working out. You know, I mean, I was working out and I was still close either to the program physically because I was in Austin or in H-Town. I didn't party too much. There wasn't much going on. I was just hanging out with the family. Uh, so I really can't relate to these guys if they're going off to these exotic lo locales. Um, Jamaica. I, I, man, Jamaica. I don't know what to say. I, These Trump guys, they can sit <laughs> different level, man. And I'm, I'm happy for them. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I, I will say this. It, for most of the guys that, and I still, like I said, I still remember guys that had that mindset. I imagine they still have this mindset today that you never stop working. You always find a way to get to work in. Um, whether that be, I was talking to, you know, some players about how now these guys, you know, they, uh, they cycle at home, right? They, you know, they, they, they cycle, they find, they, they do yoga. They find different ways to get a workout in uh, even when it's on in downtime, so, you know, and you got to be disciplined enough to not abuse things, whether you, you know, alcohol or whether it's other stuff, you know, not abuse it. Yeah, you're, you're, you're an athlete. 
your body's a fine-tuned machine. Um, so hopefully you guys still have that. You have that mindset. Now, trust me, I play with a lot of guys when they 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 worked hard, but they also partied hard. Usually I would say that's like the linemen. Linemen, man, they just <laughs> they they work hard, they they grind weight room out there, but man, when they sound the party. Man, it's mostly defensive linemen, but offensive linemen get down too. I would say those are the guys you got to watch in the downtime. Like they, they seem to splurge. They seem to, you know, I mean, they, they go up. They, to me, in my time, I said I, I'm not trying to stereotype too much, but most of the the skill the skill guys, I would say, yeah, they partied, but you know, they still got the work in. If you're looking for guys who didn't get the work in, but also was just partying in downtime. It was the lineman to worry about. Like, nah, man. Hey, man, you still gotta. You need to go for a little run. You still need to, you know, don't, you know, don't eat too much. Don't, 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 don't get extreme at the buffet. Don't be wilding out. That kind of stuff. It was the lineman. So I hate to throw that out there, but that's the truth. Hey, right, Rod. Th there's a reason they got a little belly, buddy. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. That's all I'm saying. They, they don't, they don't like to mix the two. Like when they, when it's downtown, when it's, when it, when it's off time for the lineman, they are off. Like I'm off. I ain't doing a damn thing. When it's time to work, I work. It's like, no, man, you gotta, you still gotta make sure you're disciplined enough in your diet, in you know your workouts. It's like, hey, man, I'm gonna get a workout in, you know, just to lose some weight. I'll go, you know, get a lift in, whatever it may be. So that that's, and I'm sure the players even have workouts now. They got so many resources. They got dietitians and nutritionists, and I'm sure they got actually like a spring break workout plan so they can have downtime, you know, so your muscles and everything can recover, but you can also get a little bit of work in they're they're way more advanced than we were we were just told not to, don't go to jail and you know what i mean that <laughs> and you know don't you know don't do nothing stupid and then the kind of basic stuff these guys they on a different level you know what I mean? don't I, I, go to jail don't go to jail. And sometimes it's just simple, right? Yeah. It's just, yeah, it's just we get that straight hey, up Jerry, hey Bobby Jerry, what about you two days out uh, thoughts in uh, in where this thing's headed right now for the Longhorns? I, I think uh, I think these guys are going to be jacked up. I think they're going to be ready. I think these vacations, even though they are lavish, and congrats to them being in the the initial NIL world before this thing all regulates on some form or fashion. Congrats to this group of guys that twenty one through I think twenty six class of kids is going to have it best, uh, maybe tw through twenty seven. But I think these guys are going to be jacked up. I think they're going to have something to prove this year. I'm going to stay. I'm going to. Stay on that horse, man, until I get bucked off. I think this team has um, – they got close, but they didn't quite get there, and it's a great year to be Sarkeesian, Tory Beckton. I think it's going to be a focused team. Um, I, I, you know, I, I'm so excited. Somebody asked earlier, uh, will we get an injury report? So just to lay out the schedule, first practice is at 9 a.m. on Tuesday. Sarkeesian will meet with the mid media after that practice, so that's when we'll probably get those updates on who was not out there and the why. Um, and then obviously the next, the following day is the Texas Pro Day, which Quinn will throw at the Pro Day. So it's not just spring practice for Quinn, which is number one, but that's a big day for Quinn. I mean, there's every NFL team will be represented. Um, it's going to be the new look physical Quinn. Um, it'll be a chance for him to throw right there in front of uh, a lot of NFL teams. Um, and, and so I think that I think that's big. It's a big week for Quinn. Uh, aside from spring practices, it, it's it's that first impression of your third year as a starting quarterback begins March 20th in front of those NFL scouts. But I think this team is going to be so jacked up. I think they're going to be excited. I expect a ton of energy, um, you know, and, and look, I thing that excites me is the most, this is the most early enrollees Texas has ever had in a class, 17 guys. Plus now portal, there's 20, what, 23, 24 new players for this spring. And, you know, in some years in the past in spring football, you wondered if Texas had enough offensive linemen to have a quality spring. Yeah. Now you're sitting here with almost three deep. You are three deep of offensive linemen in spring football. That is a great place to be for Steve Sarkeesian and Kyle Flood. Well, I, I would even add this uh, to, to that comment about, uh, you know, where they're at and all this other stuff. We're going to be – you and I are going to be out there on Tuesday morning, Jerry. And we're going to literally be checking the roster they give us over yes. and over to make sure we're because part of this is just getting to know all the new faces. Yeah. Right. I mean, look, I mean, it's you turn over 27, 28 players, I think, or 25 players, whatever it is. Uh, it, it's going to be tough on us a little bit, uh, but the viewing window will be about 15 to 30 minutes. That's typically what it is on yeah. the first day. Sark will meet with the media. 
Then we'll have pro day on Wednesday. Then we'll come back and meet with players on Thursday. Uh, so that's the media plan. That's all that the uh, sports information department has told us thus far that will be available. We don't know anything beyond Thursday. Um, wow. Point. Here, 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 here it is. Texas women got number one seed. Donald Britt. Thank Ooh. you. Texas women get the number one seed. That, that means they're probably the number four seed overall in the tournament. So big for them. Hey, to Bobby, um, that's awesome. Congrats to Vic Schaefer. You lose your TJ Ford, and yeah, that's what he lost, and you're still a number one seed. I know Madison Booker's his Kevin Durant. You had both of them on the same team, which kind of really sucks now going to the tournament that you had a real shot. I don't know if anybody will really beat did. South Carolina, but you had a legit, legit shot yep. uh, this year. Uh, but anyways – Bobby, we talked, Rod and CJ and I talked about it Friday, but I, you know what the other thing I'm looking forward to is that first day? Remember in August when we were there and Jordan Whittington, Xavier Worthy, um, and A.D. Mitchell walked out to the field from Newhouse, walked over to the, the bubble, the practice field, earlier than any other player outside of the specialist. And we all looked at each other and commented, Bob, we commented and said, put that in the memory bank, right? Yeah. Those guys – both days we were there were the first players out to practice other than the specialists. They even beat some of the coaches to the practice field. I, we locked that away. You know, kind of like that first practice Arch Manning ever, was ever at Texas in the spring. Or Sorry, it was not spring. But he got off the bus and sprinted in just like he used to do in high school. I was like, okay, well, that guy's fearless. I like that. He's fearless. Most guys don't just – in their first practice ever at Texas – get off the bus and sprint in like to the starting quarterback at Texas. I was like, okay, he brought the same fearlessness. That's a good thing to see. But I, I look forward to kind of the little things you notice that maybe aren't talked about much that are become so meaningful later in a season. All right. Hey, um, I've got some other things uh, to say here too. Uh, Rod, you were talking about not abusing alcohol earlier. <laughs> Remember that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They probably need to tell the Michigan coaching staff about that. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's a line coach. Mm. Uh, got into some trouble. He's been suspended 10 days into the job. Uh, it's his third run-in, apparently, with uh, alcohol mm. uh, while driving. I think one of them got pled down. Another one may have been a straight DUI. But uh, anyways, uh, 10 days into the job, he's already on the sideline. Uh, CJ did a video, by the way, guys, and, and mentioned the potential of the uh, defensive line transfers, not just at Michigan, but also UCLA. Etc. And uh, our our video uh, that had had mentioned those players, uh, the comment section got overrun by some Wolverine fans coming over and said, "What are you talking about? It's more likely that Arch Manning transfers to Michigan." <laughs> uh, uh, well, here's the problem for Michigan. Here's the problem. <laughs> this, and I'm not saying these guys are going to leave. Uh, um, obviously, people know who we're talking about Graham and Grant. But here's the problem. It, with Jim Harbaugh, other than Connor Stallions, things were pretty smooth, right? Sharon Moore, one of his first key hires, already gone. Yep. Before it spring did, practice. It didn't, didn't keep the defensive line coach or the defensive backs coach. That, that's right. So it, what it does is it adds the, the, the hint and the element of doubt right out of the gate for Kenneth Grant and Mason Graham. Whoa, things aren't the same as they used to be. That, yeah, that and, that's that's the issue that the Sharon Moore faces now with some of those guys. Now, I'm not saying they do, but if they do, that's why. Yeah. I wonder if um because isn't Wink Martindale the defensive coordinator there now? Yeah, from the NFL. Yep. And I, oh, that defensive line coach is he originally from the Michigan staff or did Wink Martindale bring him in? Uh, Mi well, Michigan staff. Sharon Moore brought him in and brought him over from Wisconsin in Luke. Okay. Perry. See, so, I wonder. It's might actually for Wink just to throw it off for Wink. I don't know what he's gonna do, but Wink Martindale is well known in the NFL. You know, yeah. for for years he's got a lot a lot of connections. I wonder for him if it may be a blessing in disguise, because his system is very specific because he blitzes a ton, yeah. and he may want a defensive line coach that really knows his system instead of bringing in a guy he's got to teach his system to. To your point, throwing it out there. Could be. Um, but here's here's the reality. If they, if they fire him, I don't know what they're doing. I think the Michigan fans are a little naive as it relates to NIL. Mm -hmm. I, I can just tell you because they did not have to go heavy NIL with Jim Harbaugh. 
And that's not going to be the case going forward. He kind of had that upperclassman buy-in. That's going to be a little bit different going forward. Well, it's the same at Bama. Same thing with Bama, right? Bama, th- Bama was getting a Nick Saban discount with a lot of players. Yeah, like 100%. Nick Saban, yeah, Nick Saban's sales pitch was, listen, man, look at my resume. I think you're an NFL player. I can get you drafted. I can maximize your potential and you'll win championships and you'll play with great players. Guys are like, you know what? Hell yeah, I'm, I'm going there. Even though I was offered more money, who gives a damn? That's Nick freaking Saban. Same thing yeah. with Jim Harbaugh. Jim Harbaugh's like, hey, man, I'm an NFL guy. You're an NFL player. Come play for us, man. I'll trust me. I know how it looks. I know, I know the path to the NFL. And I, I I'm telling you, I can put you on the right path. Come to me. We'll play uh, you know, elite teams, you'll play with great players, we'll play for championships. Sark is trying to actually build the same sales pitch right now. <laughs> That's kind of what he's trying to do. Uh, when you lose those type of dynamic personalities, and by the way, Nick Saban was there, and so is Jim Harbaugh. I mean, what's the the, the sales pitch isn't as strong with those other guys. They don't have the the resume. They don't have the clout to walk into a living room and say, man, I'm Jim Harbaugh. You, everybody everybody know me. I'm Nick Saban. Everybody know me. Yes. Yeah. The other guys, I'm sure they're good coaches, but they don't have that card to play. Well, I'll, I'll say this. Sharon Moore is not getting the discount if Kirby Smart's not getting it anymore either. That's – that's yeah. it's, it's a – it is what college football is, is about right now. Uh, yeah. Sorry about my camera shaking there. Hey, uh, Jerry, before you take off, a uh, couple of news and notes you had out of the great uh, out of the uh, Houston Combine for Under Armour uh, this weekend. Yeah, yeah. So the Houston Under Armour uh, camp, I, I was not there. Obviously, I'd had a, I had a trip planned for months before the dates came out. Um, I actually filled the camp, the Under Armour camp. I still do a little work for those guys, Billy Tucker, Tom Luganville, Craig Halbert, some really good friends of mine. Um, but I, I was not there today, but I obviously I've talked to people. Um, all, that were there. Lance Jackson was tremendous today. Um, there's some videos out there of him. And what's so impressive, and I went to Pleasant Grove a few weeks ago, what's so impressive about Lance Jackson is his maturity, his understanding, um, and then it's just his overall athleticism at 6'5 and a half, 6'6, 255, 260. I think there were reports he was 263. Today. I haven't had that confirmed, but when I was out there a few weeks ago, it was 255 to 260. But on the videos you saw, Rod, and, and we've talked about this before, a guy that lines up as a young defensive lineman and his butt's higher than his shoulders in his stance, those guys get it. Because you rarely watch tape and see a guy's ass above his shoulders in his <laughs> yeah. stance. It's normally the other way around, and those guys then pop up right off mm-hmm. the football. Yep. Lance Jackson at a young age understands that. And his quickness, power to speed was on full display today. And absolutely, uh, it was a very impressive. Uh, by the way, Landon Rink, Under Armour game uh, invite today out of that camp as well. Obviously, Lance Jackson was already a guy that had a combat. Kelshawn Johnson, all reports, I was told he was the toughest guy uh, to guard today. Kalik Lockett, very good. Andrew Marsh, smooth. Uh, really good young linebackers, Kosi Paula, uh, some of those guys, those 26s. But uh, Lance Jackson was a big-time standout today, as was Kelshawn Johnson. Kalik Lockett, who couldn't make the Dallas camp last week because of a college visit, he came, he made the trip down to Houston, got there early in the morning, and competed. What does that tell you? You want Kalik Lockett. He didn't have to come to that. He has yeah. 35 offers. He's already in. He's already has all-star game invites. That's a competitor. That's what you like to see. Yeah. Got it. All right, Jerry, thank you for joining us, bud. Do you have a great hey, Bobby, real quick. Brandon Brown was not there. Um, he's Brandon Brown's scheduled to be in Austin Friday for an unofficial visit with that California power team, which we'll be talking about that all week. Gotcha. All right. Hey, Jerry, thank you. Be safe, bud. Travel Thanks, safe. Jerry. All right. We're going to bring in CJ now, too. How you doing, CJ? Hey. What's going on, guys? How we been? Happy, uh, happy uh, we'll on you to say hello there. Hey, uh, uh, you're also not wearing green. It's St. Patrick's Day. No, What's no. I, hey, <laughs> it's Sunday inside. It was rainy a little bit today in Austin. I, I wasn't seeing the sun too much today, so yeah. I, I was staying in. Hey, uh, hey uh, uh, by the way, the road Spurs game, I, I want to say this. Somebody sent me this. Matt, if you'll pull this up. Uh, we just talked about the, the Texas women getting a, uh, a, first, uh, a number one seed in the women's tournament. Uh, Matt, I sent you a photo. Uh, Texas uh, is hosting a, or Moody is hosting some San Antonio Spurs games. 
Yeah, uh, did, a friend yeah. of mine sent uh, sent this picture in just moments ago. Said all the stars are out uh, here in uh, Austin tonight. Uh, there's a little Steve Sarkeesian sighting at the Spurs game tonight for you guys. Uh, he's hey. uh, in on hand uh, trying to get ready for that. Hey, uh, let's uh, take some questions if y'all don't mind. Did hey, you, you have know, something? Uh, it was you know, I, I, I just said, I think the guy he's hanging out with is David Mulligetta, who's the, oh, the NFL agent. <laughs> super agent. Yeah, who's like the agent of, I mean, he's got tons of guys. He's Quandre Diggs' yep. agent. He's like, he's got, he's one of the probably top three biggest agents in the league right now. And he's a, he's a, he's a lifetime long one. Lives in Austin. Yeah. Somewhere in Austin. It, I, I went to the Spurs game Friday at the Moody Center, actually. Really, really fun environment. They sold it out. It was awesome. 16,000 people filled the stands. LaMarcus Aldridge uh, courtside right next to the, the the Nuggets bench. Really cool. They honored him and Chris Bosh as well, who was also courtside. So the Stars were out in Austin at the Moody Center. Really cool to see the NBA taking over uh, in Austin as well. No, Wimby, man. You got to see Wimby. Wimby's one of them athletes you got to see live and in person. It's, it's not a lot of athletes that – I would say are on that list where, man, I, I got to try to see them live. Like LeBron's on that list. Hell, for me, Patrick Mahomes was, but not for a lot of people. But that's a rare list of athletes where they're they are basically uh, in their their spectacle into unto themselves. And that's what Wimby is. Like I don't even need to know who Wimby's playing. I don't care. I I just want to see. I want to watch him go up and down the court. Some freak of nature we've never seen before. Like I wish I could have seen Shaq. Like he's gonna be on that list of like all time great players you want to see in person. Definitely. I saw Shaq. I saw Shaq oh. in the high school state championship game. Oh man, that, <laughs> that was great. I bet mean, that was awesome. Like, what the hey, hell? Antonio he Cole, baby. Yeah, yeah. Hey, it, it wasn't by the way, that was not a 5A school back in the day. That was Shaq versus 3A. <laughs> what? <laughs> yes. Oh man, that's <laughs> you're talking about unfair. They had the they had the one four zone. They went, they went the one zone. It wasn't. A, it wasn't the. What is that old? The, the, oh man! Remember. Diamond in one. Yeah, it was the one. Yeah, yeah. It was the. It was the diamond and it was the one in diamond. That's <laughs> what it is. <laughs> yeah, that's wild, but, man. Uh, good stuff. Hey, uh, we got some other uh, news and notes we want to get to. Uh, I mentioned earlier the baseball team won four to three uh, today, but they lost Friday and Saturday. Um, they now they're three and three in league play. Um, David Pierce right now has some issues, uh, particularly on the mound, it looks like. Just not being able to hold leads uh, and uh, opponents scoring a lot of points right now uh, as well. All right, we're going to take a look at some more questions from you guys now the rest of the way here. Uh, let's start with Justin Yarbrough with the Super Chat. Will, and it, Rod, I want you to think, answer this one. Will Gunnar Helm be drafted? I'm thinking he will be if he can improve like he has every year and still be an upgrade over the tight ends before Sark came. Thanks, guys. Ready for Tuesday. What do you think? Gunnar Helm draftable or on the cusp, undrafted free agent? Where you got him? Uh, he's, a, he's a year away. He's a year away. Yeah, he's a year away. Thank you for that, Justin. I got. I would say he has to take a huge leap this year because we just haven't seen the productivity, right? I mean, Sark, uh, all that productivity for the tight end position was funneled toward JT Sanders because JT Sanders is a matchup nightmare for any defense uh, with Gunnar Helm. I'm not sure that is the case, but it'll be up to Sark to prove that. Now, Sark has said the tight end position is the second most important position in his offense, you know, behind the quarterback position. So if Gunnar Helm is now the front line tight end, he's the guy. Now they brought in Amari Nyblack, who may be a better option at vertical shots downfield. But if Gunnar Helm is going to be the guy, they kind of funnel all the tight end production uh, to this year that he can prove that right now. I just haven't seen a production, not saying he can't do it. Obviously Sark likes him and he's got, you know, really good, uh, really good overall skill set. I'd like to see him improve as a blocker too. I think he's kind of a, an average to below average blocker right now. And I think that was probably the case for JT Sanders too. He was probably an average blocker as well, but he was such an elite downfield threat um, that, you know, and he had only been playing the position for what three years he was a five-star just overall athlete coming in. He has higher upside than a guy like Gunnar Helm. So I don't know if Gunnar Helm's got that kind of upside. Uh, it's, it's up to Sark to showcase that. Um, that that'll be a big – can Sark showcase his overall skill set as a tight end? Because right now, I don't know if he's a guy that can consistently beat man-to-man -man coverage of a safety, beat man-to-man -man coverage of versatile linebackers 
that's going to be the question. Amari Nye Black actually is shown that, yes, he can. He can be a vertical threat like that. So it's going to be up to Gunnar Helm to take that leap, you know, for trying to maximize his skill set, uh, his athletic profile as a tight end. But also I want to see what Sark does. Sark, Sark has a really deep wide receiving core, right? This is one of the questions I'm, I'm pondering too. Really deep wide receiving core. So is he going to expand his circle of trust of wide receivers? If he does that, then that's a lot of production that's going to get funneled there. Um, what is he going to do with the running backs? What's the target share there? Uh, hell, if he if he's if he's listening to Rod B, it's going to be more pony packages. So that means less tight ends on the field, or fewer tight ends on the field, I should say. Um, are we going to see some of that red package from Alabama with the 10 personnel, one back, zero tight ends, where there's no tight ends on the field at all? That's not really in Sark's the really nature as a play caller. But I can say at one time when his wide receiving core was deep, he decided to, you know, funnel usage towards the strength of the roster, which he's done recently with the two back sets, I think too. So one of my questions is where is the 12 personnel package going to go? Is it going to increase or decrease? Because JT Sanders, knows we're going to see fewer 12 personnel snaps because the six O line package has also taken some of those 12 personnel. They run big 12 and they run uh, big 11 personnel with the extra offensive lineman out there, Malik Agbo. So that is a great question. I, I think a lot of it is up to will Sark showcase his talent. Because I don't know what his talent, I don't really know what he brings to the table offensively because he's just been a complimentary piece to the offense. He hasn't been showcased. This will be the year. CJ, where, where do you got him? Where, where do you got Gunnar Helm? I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit like Rod in that it's a prove it situation, right? Yeah. At the same time, I think he has the talent. I, I think he's a late round draft pick potentially if he keeps growing. The thing with him, Rod and CJ, to me, he always had the the he had the he had the 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 long lanky build he that does. doesn't always work in the NFL, right? He's gonna have to play on the line of scrimmage because he's not a downfield threat. Like right. he's not Travis Kelsey or Rob Gronkowski that can go run. Exactly. Four five five or whatever they can run, right? At that, but he can run well enough. But he's going to have to be an on the line of scrimmage guy. And every year, to Justin Yarbrough's point, he's raised the bar for himself. I mean, he went from a really skinny tight end prospect to a guy that looked pretty good last year at times and started yeah. filling out. I don't know if he'll be drafted, but I, I think he's got a chance to make a pro team. I do too. I think he does have an NFL future. And and to y'all's point, he has taken those steps year in and year out, Rod, even more so in the blocking category. I think he's taken the steps to be uh, – uh, he can become a plus blocker there. The thing there on the line of scrimmage for a tight end is more mental than anything else. Are you willing to go put your hat on a guy that's 320 when you're coming across the line of scrimmage uh, for a wham or uh, you know one of those pulling blocks that they ask line, or tight ends to do so often? That's really where you'll see the improvement heading into the SEC. He's going to be tested often, uh, but more so when he is on the field, I think he takes advantage of that opportunity a little bit uh, more so than guys in that kind of same role that he has. Uh, 14 catches, 190 yards last year, two touchdowns. What was really encouraging to me was when Texas needed him to stand up and be that guy at the tight end spot, he did so. Four, or four receptions, 67 yards, and a score against Oklahoma in the game in which Jatavian Sanders was not 100%. Big games. They needed him to fill the shoes. And I thought he had a pretty admirable admirable game there. Uh, if you can continue that trajectory of incline uh, in, in, in play right there, I think that you're going to become a pretty, pretty good player for the Texas Longhorns. And as a result, and because of the offense Sarkeesian runs and, you know, the strength and conditioning program Tory Becton has behind the scenes, you're going to have yourself in a position at the end of the day to be an NFL tight end. It all, again, depends on what kind of steps can you continue to see Gunnar Helm take in this spring? I'm looking for him to become a more physical blocker, a more willing blocker, and obviously, like we've talked about, that downfield ability. What can he bring into his bag as a result of this spring? Because that's ultimately going to be a big selling point for NFL teams if he can become a plus in both of those sides of the ball at the tight end spot. I, I just like Gunnar as an overall prospect. Brandon Ralston has another question here for us. Super chat. Thank you, Brandon. I'm curious, will we take both D tackles from Michigan? I'm going to say this. Yes is the answer. But those are also top-end draft pick defensive tackles. I am told that Texas is looking for two, not just one, but two defensive tackles in the portal. Still, even though they already got one. 
I like that. Okay. They're not that. Look, mm -hmm. Steve Sarkeesian is not here to play. I'm just telling you guys that he wants it. He wants. It. He thinks he has a team that can win it all this year. Now, whether they can or not, it's a different story. But he's. I mean, he's got the receivers. He's got the running backs. He's got everything on defense. I think, except for possibly defensive tackles. He's going to roll the dice and try to go get those. It, it, those guys may not – neither one of them may go into the portal. CJ, I was talking about this, uh, and you made that uh, mention uh, video this morning about it, and the Wolverine fans came out and, look, we're monitoring those guys. We're monitoring the guy at UCLA. There's a half dozen guys out there that Texas would jump on if they were going go the portal. We're not yep. saying they're in the portal. We're not saying they're going in the portal. But – the reality of it is there Texas is going to be aggressive in that category. And I don't want people to, to, to take it. Uh, otherwise, Hey, CJ, this one is for you from Ryan Nelson. Uh, thank you, Ryan. CJ, if we get swept by air force, Chris Del Conte has a decision. I'm guessing this is talking about wow. uh, head football coach, David Pierce, who's been to this college world series, three of his five years, one of which are three of six, one of which got taken away by the way. Uh, from uh, uh, from him uh, because of COVID. So really three of five years. What are your thoughts on this, CJ? Yeah, I mean, if you get swept by Air Force, it gets a little interesting because now you're sitting at 11 and 10, 21 games in. The series loss to Washington probably wasn't what Texas fans wanted to see. It wasn't what this team needed to see on the field uh, as well. But my point and what I think Texas fans kind of harp a little bit too much on for David Pierce is, there's such turnover for his roster as year in and year out, it feels like. It just takes time. It takes time each year. We've seen slow starts seemingly every year besides one where we've seen, yep. you know, it, it, it take about 15, 20, 25 games before we really understand the identity of this Texas program uh, for a given season. You know, we've seen Texas start five and seven multiple times for, through the first 12. Now that we're 21 games in, or 19, excuse me, the leash gets a little shorter, but you start to get a little bit of an idea of what this team can be. I think by the middle of the Big 12 uh, schedule is that when you really start getting an idea of this team, we've seen it again, time in, time out. Texas baseball figures out who they are uh, deeper in the season than I think most Texas uh, teams do athletically. My question with this team Where's who's the star power for this team right now? If it's LeBaron Johnson on the mound on Friday, he's got to step up. If it's Porter Brown, as we kind of expected in that, that cleanup spot in the lineup, he's got to step up. He's hitting about 235 right now. The slugging isn't great. He had a good run at the back end of that uh, tournament in Houston, but where's that consistency been? You don't have a Cody Clemens. You don't have a Hispanic Titanic. Who's going to be that guy in the middle of your lineup that in, invokes fear? Right now it's Peyton Powell, but he needs a Robin to his Batman. There's not another guy right now in that lineup that's really standing out like you anticipated coming in. And when you don't have that and your pitching isn't great, your starting pitching on Saturday, or Friday and Saturday isn't great, add to the fact that your bullpen has all sorts of question marks, then you really start getting that hairy situation as a manager in the baseball world. So it, it's got to turn around, and I'm looking at that Baylor – series coming up next weekend as one that Texas can really start getting the ball rolling again because then you got Kansas State coming up on the road the next weekend after that you can string off about five five out of six games I think is a is a really good run over the next uh, week or so if if so Texas is uh, going to turn that corner and I'm, I'm I'm feeling confident that Texas is going to find a way into that you know kind of upper echelon of the Big 12 moving forward I misspoke earlier guys I said Texas is now three and three in conference play Obviously, Texas and Washington are not in the same conference. That's my my bad. My apologies there uh, for you guys uh, as well. Uh, hey, Matt, I want to bring up this photo. Here's some more photos, uh, guys, uh, from the Spurs game tonight in Austin. Look at that trio. That's Brandon Harris on the far left, uh, mm -hmm. Texas director of player personnel. In the middle, I believe, is John T. Cook. And on the far right, uh, big old Anthony Hill there, there hanging hey. out. Rod, did you ever spend your spring break with the uh, feet on the wood at an NBA game before? No, nah, I didn't. Um, man, I, I, I've, been, I've never been to courtside actually at an NBA <laughs> game. I've been, I've been close to the court, but never courtside where feet are on the court. No, man, no, nah, man, I, I, I've never done that. So, hey, these young bucks, like I said, they they live at large, man. And I, hey, it's the greatest time in the history of college sports to be a college athlete. It's never been I done. 
Rod, I've seen, your, I've seen your basketball tickets. You're in the first five or six rows, my man. Hey, as I, I said, like I said, I, I'm close, I but not on the court. <laughs> okay, not, not on the court. court. First five or six rows, still pretty good. That's that's it's that's It's really good. Hey, uh, that. I want to say thanks one more time. I appreciate everybody's questions. We're going to get to yours next. That's what we're going to do in the next segment. Uh, but for right now, I want to come back and just say thank you to our sponsor. Our newest sponsor is Joe Brown, your veteran mortgage professional. Joe has been providing mortgages in, in and around Austin and the state of Texas for more than three decades. In fact, he was my mortgage broker more than 25 years ago for my first ever home purchase. Uh, you can trust him. He's reliable, uh, knowledgeable, has done this for so long. Uh, he also has two degrees from the University of Texas and worked with a number of different UT athletes throughout his career. Joe's also a proud Navy veteran uh, as well. Give him a call, 512-663-4744. If you're looking for a mortgage, that's 512-663-4744. That's Joe Brown, your veteran mortgage professional. All right, uh, let's uh, turn back a little bit here uh, and get going on some questions. We had some that I thought were coming in. Let's turn back to basketball a little bit, okay? Uh, and CJ, you are uh, you and Jerry are resident basketball experts. Uh, Jerry had a comment here that he thought Texas actually matched up better with Colorado State. What do you think tech, from Nathan? He, what do you think Texas match up better with Virginia or Colorado State in your mind? Yeah, no, I, Virginia's not been the team that we've seen Virginia be in years past, especially when they ran off into a, a national championship run. But, you know, anytime you get into a, a rock fight with them, that's not what you want to see, especially with a team like Texas that likes to run and shoot and it kind of live and die a little bit by the three. Obviously, D'Souza is going to be a big part of that as well. But with Ace Smith, Tyrese Hunter, IT Horton, some of these guys who really get hot behind the line of uh, the three-point line, getting into a, a low possession game with Virginia doesn't bode well for the Longhorns. I'd personally like to see Colorado State, but that's not to say that Colorado State also doesn't uh, bring some matchup issues to the Longhorns. Uh, they, 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 they play a very fun style of basketball, um, but again, if you can stay away from that Virginia team who likes to hold teams below 55, 50 points, even that's not a recipe for success for Texas. You need to be able to, to launch those threes, get the extra possessions because that's a big strength of this team. I know Texas fans are kind of rolling their eyes right now thinking strength of this team, you know, what, what are those? But, you know, you do have, you know, plus shooters on this roster that can catch fire in an instant. Listen, we saw Tyrese Hunter, for all his faults, go for 30 against Oklahoma just over a week ago. We know he can do that. Max Aismas is top 10 all-time in points. Those guys can get really, really hot behind the line, of, uh, the three-point line. Again, I, I think you you want to stay away from Virginia and that slow pace as much as possible. Hey, Matt, if you'll bring up that, uh, that uh, Midwest region uh, lineup, I just want to go back over it for people that are just now joining us. We've got a couple of hundred, hundred people join us since the start of the show. Uh, Texas is in the Midwest region. But their subregion is in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, Texas plays the winner of a Virginia Colorado State play in game on Tuesday. Texas plays the winner of that at 550 on Thursday. Uh, then if Texas were to win that game, they go to the round of six uh, round of 32 and play the winner of Tennessee versus St. Pete's uh, St. Peter's, excuse me. St. Peter's, by the way, uh, excuse me, Tennessee, by the way, uh, just uh, in Knoxville, literally, is about, what, a three-hour drive uh, to Charlotte, and uh, they will travel. Uh, so that's oh, yeah. going to essentially be a Tennessee home game, uh, we believe, at this point, too. Uh, so good luck to them. The women's uh, basketball team, by the way, ended up being the number one or one of the one seeds across nice. the NCAA tournament. So correct, congratulations to them. All right, Rod, I want to get this. Uh, it's a two-part question from two, two different people. Uh Travis McDermott, should I feel disappointed about Sadir's weight? We needed him this year. And then David <laughs> Williams asked this. If I was involved in the Texas strength and conditioning program, I would enforce a rule that Cam Williams and Sadir Mitchell had to weigh in every day. What do you, what do you think of that? Um, yeah, I mean, I, mean I, 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 like I said, when I see the weights of the guys, the assumption is, all right, there's a plan here, right? Because you got to be keeping track of players' weights throughout the off-season workouts, throughout spring. And you, and like I said, I, I don't know what's, if they are, but I assume they are because they kept track of our big guys' weights. 
uh, um, all throughout offseason workouts and throughout spring and then two a days, trying to make sure it was under control for the guys who were, you know, just honestly, just big humans. I mean, just like Sark said, they're just big humans. And you don't want to get to the point where their weight af- affects their performance in a negative way. Um, it helps. If Andre Sweat was 365, he said he played that, but he, he played really well. I mean, he won the Allen Trophy playing at that weight, and, and he went to the combine at that weight. And by the way, at the combine, you could you could argue now that hurt his draft stock, right? That that did not help his draft stock going there because there aren't many humans that have been that big in the NFL where that weight has translated to them playing at a really high level. Not saying he can't be the outlier there as well. So yeah, it's it's concerning to me. I, I would assume that they were tracking it and that they would have been trying to keep it under control or put them on some type of, I don't know, regimen, some other diet. They got nutritionists, all that stuff. Um, and maybe he is just a, like I said, big human and he plays really well at that weight. Not many human beings on this planet can play football effectively at 370 some pounds. And so I, I can't wait to, I want to see it. I want to see it for myself. Um, but I can't imagine that he's playing his best football. At 370. Maybe he can go out there and give you some reps at it. But the best version of Sidney Mitchell, there's no way it's at 372. There's no way. It, 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 may, it, may, be, it may be at 372 in four or five years. Yeah. Not, not, yeah. not yeah, right that, now. Put on the real kind of physical weight. The, the, yeah. the, the adult weight. Not the grown man body. Yeah. Grown yeah. man. That's a great way to put it. Yeah. Grown man body. Yeah, but you know what? I, like I said, maybe he's maybe he's his body is different. Maybe he's on an accelerated path to you know his development. I, I we don't know. I, we got to see it. We got to see it for ourselves. I just want to see the way he carries it, and I want to see it, it, get a chance to go out to practice potentially to, to watch that young man. But yeah, I I think if listen if if it's a problem, basically meaning the coaches have kind of talked to him about it and they're trying to keep it under control and they want him at a desired weight. And yet he has not been disciplined enough to follow that path. If that's the case, I'm not saying it is at all. Um, then it's a it's a real problem. But like my assumption is the coaches are very aware of it, and this is kind of where they want him. It's the same thing with Savion Red. Why we're like, why, why did Savion Red gain 26 pounds? <laughs> what the hell happened there? We're like, well, it must be a, a plan. Sark wants him to be a short yardage goal line back. He wants him to be my version. I told him the new cow juice check, kind of a Frankenstein monster of a fullback in Sark's offense in the pony package. Cause there's gotta be a plan when the guy gains that much weight or when the guy's that big, what is the, should the Mitchell come in at? What was the weight that he came in at initially? Do we know Probably that in range to be honest with you? Okay. There you go. I got, if he was gaining weight, I guess it would be an issue, but maybe that's just his weight. We got to see it. We got to see him move in it and we got to see what type of, like I said, explosive first step he has with that weight and if he can move around other human beings and all that kind of stuff with that weight, that's a lot of weight, though, man. It's a lot. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, I could not agree more. I could not agree more. Hey, a uh, couple other things. Uh, Donald Harvey asked in the in the uh, chat what time the game is, uh, for what time tip is. It's 5.50 is what we're being told, Donald. Uh, 5.50 on Thursday afternoon. Uh, yeah. And that's central time, uh, not, uh, not uh, East Coast time. All right, and it's going to be exciting that that's going to start the second half of games Thursday night. So you're going to get your afternoon games. The, the game right before that one, uh, the Texas game tips off will be around four. So those four games that you see at a time will be ending up. Texas will start the second half of games for the night slate, which will be a, a little exciting. They'll probably have a 20, 25 minute window before the next game start tips off. So a little bit more of a national audience for the Longhorns in their uh, 710 matchup with winner Virginia and Colorado State. Hey, this is a good question here. Um, we talked about Baron Sorrell, or excuse me, Gunnar Helm. Uh, guys, we're talking about how Baron Sorrell is very similar uh, to Gunnar Helm and the fact that it, Baron's just played more, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, been called on to play more. They, he didn't have a JT Sanders at his position. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's very similar uh, in, in that regard from a draft perspective. But look at this question, Rod and CJ. How many Texas wide receivers will be drafted in 2025. Now, to be clear, Jonte Cook can't go pro. None, yeah. none, none of the guys that Texas recruited out of high school really can. But Isaiah Bond will be draft eligible if he chooses to forego his senior year. Matthew Golden, same thing. 
Uh, Silas Bolden obviously uh, would be uh, in that category as well. How many receivers of those three newcomers do you think gets drafted in 2025? I One for sure. Yeah, one, one for sure. sure. Isaiah Bond's getting drafted. Yeah, yeah. He's too explosive, um, 10, 500 meter speed, has been productive. Uh, the question is, does a guy like Silas Bolden get drafted or is he an undrafted free agent even though he's productive? Matthew Golden, that's whether or not he's even going to go pro next year. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah. It's, it's actually a funny question because you're limited to only four options, zero, one, two, or three. You know, but there's only going to be three draft eligible eligible guys on the roster uh, for the next year's draft. I, I'll go with two. I do think a year in the system for uh, Silas Bolden with the production that he's had at Oregon State previously is going to bode very well for his uh, NFL draft stock. What that is, I'm not sure. There aren't many five eight, five nine wide receivers in the NFL fewer that are drafted very highly. With that said, you're seeing more of a switch in the NFL to some of these kind of scat back wide receivers that have that smaller frame that can come across the line of scrimmage as a jet motion or an orbit motion even and still be effective down the field. Silas Bolden plays significantly larger than he's listed at. If you watch any of the tape, his ability to go up, make big plays down the field vertically. Again, he's not one of those guys that you saw a whole lot of on the underneath. They were throwing the ball pretty far down the field for him at Oregon State with DJU. Uh, I do think he plays larger than he's listed at. But the question is, what kind of market is there for a 5'8", five, 5'9", five, guy? I do think he's going to test very well. We've talked about the speed, the burst, the agility. The acceleration specifically off the line of sh- uh, scrimmage is something that jumps off with when you watch him as well. Uh, but that's going to be interesting because, uh, Bobby, I'm with you. I do think Isaiah Bond is a guy that you can probably lock up, barring injury, uh, as a guy that will hear his name called very early in next year's draft. Silas Bolden is that guy for me that I'm thinking could push that over the one and a half kind of line that we're looking at right now. What about you, Rod? What do you think? I mean, Matthew Gold's guy that's one of the better kick returners in the country. That, that's an added value uh, proposition if he were to go pro. It is an added value. And honestly, if the NFL changes the kick return, uh, which they are thinking about changing their kickoff return to the XFL kickoff return, uh, which is gonna, I mean, has a 90% return rate as opposed to the, the really high touchback rate the NFL is dealing with right now, that, that really would start to uh, increase the value of guys like a Matthew Golden. Not saying he's going to get drafted because of that, but it would increase his value as a priority free agent, somebody that can end up making a roster because he is an elite kickoff returner. Like he is, he's one of the best kickoff returners in the country. Um, I don't know if that will get you drafted simply these days. And if it did, it'll get you drafted really, really late. But I agree with, with CJ. I think if it's anybody, it would be Silas Bowden just based on what we've seen, but it would be later on in the draft for a guy that's as small as he is. And I don't think he is a, I, I know he's going to, as well with the speed, but I do wonder exactly what he'll weigh in at. People forget that X Man weighed in at 166. You know, I talked to NFL scouts, they're like, Yeah, you can say what he won't, man. He's still 166. And I was like, He can play though. He plays bigger and he plays, you know, I think uh, his play strength is actually something you can see uh, on, on film, right? And he plays a, a more physical style than a guy like that would play. That's what you're saying about Silas Bolden. So I think he could translate to the NFL. I don't know if he's going to get drafted really high. There's no doubt Isaiah Bunn has the potential to be a first round guy um, yeah. if everything goes right for him. I, I got to, I, you just threw me for a loop a little bit with the XS, XFL kickoff uh, yeah. thing. Mm-hmm. I'm reading about what it is. And this is for, I'm sure I'm not the only one that doesn't know what, didn't know what that was. Here's the X, X, XFL's kickoff rule a kicker lines up at his own 30 yard line with the other 10 members of the kickoff team lining up at the opponent's 35-yard line. So they're all all the way on the other side of the field, five yards away from the returning team. So it's basically – They're right close. The kicker's at at his own 30. The defense is at the the 35, and the offense is at the 30. Yep. The kicker and returner are the only players who can move until the ball is fielded. So basically, that that is crazy. That's 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 an interesting. Uh, it looks like it's uh, it may, may or may not happen. I who knows? I mean, they need yeah. what are they twenty votes or something like they that? They need uh, they need three fourths votes. So they need basically seventy five percent vote. But 
it's there's a lot of momentum for it because essentially the kickoff returns a dead play. They in the Super Bowl, it, really it was all is. touchbacks, right? Nobody cares about the kickoff anymore. And they they shadow banded for the most part because it's the most violent play in football. Hell, I got hurt on kickoffs, but now they they found that the XFL kickoff re return is a whole lot safer. Like you said, no car collisions, there's no high speed collisions happening on a football field because the guys are so close together at five yards, they can't really build up this high speed to end up, you know, having those concussions or those high collision plays. And you almost guarantee there's going to be at least a 15, 20 yard return because there's so much space, so much space for the returners, depending on how skilled they are. So it's a lot safer for the returners, which means NFL teams may start putting some of their best players, their big money players back there again. Remember when I was young, hell, Deion Sanders, you know, big money guys. Hell, if not, then Randy Moss would go back there and return kicks. Your big money guys return kicks back in the day. They don't do that now because it's the most violent play in football and you don't want your big money guys to get hurt. Well, if the injury rate is really low, big money guys don't get hurt. I'll put my big money guys back there or I'll prioritize it with a guy like a Matthew Golden or a guy like a Keelan Robinson who are the best kick returners potentially in the draft class and go, all right, priority free agent. I need that guy because that guy's going to be my kick returner for the next five to six years. You know what I mean? Because now it's actually something that can gain me a huge advantage in the hidden yardage department. So in it, oh, trust me, they pass it. And I think they will. I think they will. They think the NFL, the NFL is all about what's, what's the most entertaining product. And the kickoff sucks because it's not a, a play nobody cares about anymore. Everybody knows it's going to be a touchback. But now you can infuse drama back into the situation. That's what the NFL wants to do. Now they're going to make that a dramatic play again. And now you ain't going to bathroom breaks or going to get nachos during the kickoff anymore. You're like, damn, and I'm sticking around because now they're actually – there are big plays now being made on kickoffs. I, I got to add this. It's not just the uh... – the, the the kickoff in the NFL is literally nobody returns it anymore because no. these kickers they're hitting sixty five yard field goals. I mean they're making a fifty five yarder look like chump change. Exactly. I mean they, they've got such powerful legs and all this other stuff. The other thing is the other thing I hate about the kickoff now is because there's no actual play. You literally could get a score a touchdown, go to commercial, get a kickoff, then go to commercial, yep. and then you come back out. So literally, there's no field of play for yep. you know what eight to ten commercials. You're right. So that's, that's the thing that the NFL does that drives me bananas. I'd like to have sat in that room and that rule is being proposed because without the visual aid and the way that you kind of have to explain that to a room of executives, owners, or GMs or whoever is proposing that rule change, I'm sure they're sitting back thinking, I mean, how in the world does this work, Rod? I mean, yeah. you sit there, yeah, we're going to pull everybody 20 yards away from the kickoff or turner. They can't move until the, there's a green light with the catch. And then, oh, oh yeah, man. that'll be much more of a better product than what we already expected. That would have been, to be a fly in the wall in that room would have been awesome to hear because I'm sure a lot of folks would have sat back around and said, what in the world? Hey, hey, hats off for some people trying to be inventive. I, I think I actually Absolutely. think it is. All right, last question. We're going to end up with this one. Uh, before I let y'all go, I, and before we end with this question, I want to repeat, Longhorns, number seven seed in the NCAA tournament in the Midwest region. They play in Charlotte on Thursday at 550 against the winner of a play-in game, uh, the uh, Colorado State Rams versus the Virginia Cal Cavaliers. Uh, they play the winner of that. They're also in the Tennessee uh, section of the draw. So yeah. if they beat that play in, uh, beat the team that plays in winner, then they'll go in and play on Saturday against Rick Barnes. Mm. And, and the volunteers most likely. Uh, so that's one. The women's team, a number one seed overall. Uh, not overall, but one of the four women's seeds. Uh, also, Scotty Scheffler wins the Players' Championship. Congrats to the former Longhorn for doing that today. I think he shot a minus eight. Came yeah. from out of nowhere to win that. Uh, not out of nowhere, but hey. way back uh, yeah, to win man. that. Uh, and then also uh, the Texas baseball team. Uh, lost two of three this weekend to the University of Washington. And one last note, uh, Lance Jackson, uh, the defensive lineman out of Pleasant Grove, who's been on this program with us. Uh, it it would be unsurprising to me if he now ended up as a five-star in multiple different recruiting rankings uh, based on how he performed today down in Houston. All right, the last question, uh, leave this one open for everybody. Who is going to be the hardest hitter this year? We need some headhunters. Who's the hardest hitter? 
That's is good. it Anthony Hill? It's is Anthony it Hill. Right? But in the secondary, which I think is where this question is posed to, that's going to be a big question mark. What kind of weight do we see Derek Williams come in at? Can he add to his coverage ability as a now a, a headhunter at safety? That'd be interesting. Uh, Rod, I'll, I'll defer to you here for the safeties, but it, it's Anthony Hill without a doubt. The way that guy tries to plant people beneath the earth's crust every time he gets his hands on him is one of the most intriguing and interesting things that I see every Saturday for the Longhorns. Well, yeah, and he just uh, – he closes space really well. I mean, he just – he really he – min he minimizes space really well. And so does Makuba. And Makuba doesn't really hit hard. I, I mean, in terms of being a headhunter, uh, but he gets there really fast in terms of making plays. Uh, that's good. Who's going to try to – I mean, man, Derek Williams, what, he suspended for half the game for targeting? Uh, it's, it's weird to say because guys On a kickoff. Not, On a kickoff right? that wasn't returned. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I think for, for guys these days, it's tough because they're not programmed, or at least they've been deprogrammed because of the targeting rules and, and stuff like that to be headhunters and go after guys. I mean, I remember when, man, we had guys that literally they were they were they were trying to take somebody's head off. They were trying to deliver haymakers. My boy Nathan Dasher was like that, trying to deliver hell, Quandre Diggs as, as early as recent as Quandre Diggs trying to deliver haymakers. I don't I think now because of the targeting rules, you're almost as a defender deprogram for that. But if I have to pick one, it'd be Anthony Hill. If I pick one in the secondary, I'll go with, um, man, I'll go with a young Derrick Williams. I think he's young enough to still be like, nah, man, I'm, I'm about to prove something. And I think he, you know, a veteran like McCoob, he's like, nah, I'm just trying to make the play. I ain't trying to get, to, I ain't trying to get suspended. All right. You know, for a game or that kind of thing, I ain't trying to get disqualified. I think a young Derrick Williams still might go out there and try to try to prove, make a name for himself. I'll go Derek. Hey Williams. guys, I, I I lied a little bit because Jason Washington came up with a really good question here. I know there are many players we're anxious to see this spring, uh, but who's your dark horse on both offense and defense? You believe can shock Longhorn Nation? I want to put this one in there. I said the other one was going to be our last question, but it's this one from Jason. Who, who do y'all think a uh, surprise offense and defense? Surprise for me on defense is going to be Jelani McDonald. Uh, I think he's going to have a chance to play a little bit this year. Uh, not sure. How, but I and I don't expect him to look great from the first practice either, by the way. But I think by the time spring ball finishes, he's going to be a guy that's up there. Uh, on offense for me, it's tough. I, offense is much tougher. I, I may go DeAndre Moore. Yep, I may go DeAndre Moore or Trey Wiseman. I just look, I yes, still sir. love Wiseman as running back, guys. So I know people are saying, Oh, well, Jaden Blue, this and, and Jaden Blue's a really good receiver. So I'm not – but Trey Weiser may be a better runner than Jaden Blue. Um, so that, that's, that's going to be where I'm at. Yeah, I'll go Daring Gallette on the defensive side of the ball. What can he prove as a spring ball? Uh, Bobby, you actually took both of the guys that were on the top of my brain a little bit uh, for your two picks. But Daring Gallette, because we know coming out of high school, the type of athlete he was running the leg, uh, the anchor of a four-by-two that ended up, you know, in the state uh, the state finals – uh, is is in mighty impressive at 6'3", 220. Uh, seeing it in person was one of the most impressive uh, feats I saw that entire recruiting cycle. Now that he's 100% healthy and in his first spring, what can he be on the field? Texas is, you know, going to have a, a little bit of an opportunity there at the linebacker spot. What can he do off the edge as well? Uh, Darren Gillette's my pick defensively. Offensively, again, I was going to go with somebody like uh, DeAndre Moore. I'll actually stick at wide receiver Aaron Butler. Let's see what he can do in this spring. He was a late addition, not a lot of tape, not a lot of time in that last cycle for, for a lot of Texas folks to look back and say, all right, we know what we have with this guy, the way he kind of slid into the class the, the final hour. Aaron Butler, to me, is a guy who you watch the tape again, you're like, how did it take so long for somebody to say, yeah, come join our class? Well, the chips fell correctly for Texas to add him late, and I think they're going to you know, really reap the rewards of getting him in the fold and having him side the dollar line. What about you, Rod? Yeah. Surprise uh, on offense, defense? Dark horse. Uh, the offense, uh, man, offense is so stacked. Uh, dark horse, somebody who hadn't really shown anything, basically, what we're talking about yet, but they can have a breakout campaign during spring. How about a Ryan Niblet? How about, there you go. Okay. Uh, the guy known as being a speedster. I mean, he kind of fits the Sark mode of a wide receiver, um, but honestly, it's kind of been – Somebody who's been almost recruited over, you would say, and really yeah, hadn't yeah. hurt. To your point, Dark Horse, 
to your point, Rod, dark horse can mean he's either behind a bunch of guys, right, that are better yeah. than that have been well, perceived as better than him, or he's coming out of the blue. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm saying. Like, yeah, he's, and I, I, I don't mean recruited over in a bad way, but it just seems like a lot. Of, they've brought in some guys lately, and it seems like those guys are at least projected to get more playing time to start. He's been there a while. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll go there as a dark horse. Um, defensively, oh, that's good. Defensively, um, dark horse. How about how about a Gavin Holmes? Does that is that count? Ooh. Yes, because I he's he's buried right now. To your point, right. yeah, I, I I right. I think we're expecting some of the youngsters to come up and start taking some of those reps at corner. You know, I guess I could go with I could go to like a Jalen Gilbo kind of in the same. I could go a Jalen Gilbo slash Gavin Holmes. Gavin Holmes has played more, so maybe I'll go Jalen Gilbo, who hadn't really played as much, and he's dealt with some injuries, and there's been buzz about him, but you know, never really seen it materialize. So I'll go with Jalen Gilbo. I'll go. I'll go there in the secondary. Not bad at all, Rod. I yeah. I, I like those. I like those picks. I like those picks a lot. All right, uh, that's going to do it for this Sunday night live stream. Thank you to Joe Brown. Uh, you're a veteran mortgage broker, 512-663-4744. If you want to get uh, in on your mortgage and get it going this week, 512-663-4744. Uh, also, I want to say thank you to Rod Babers and CJ Vogel, as well as our producer, Matt Hutchison. Uh, and thanks to all of you for joining us. Uh, everybody have a good week. Uh, and by the way, wear green. You guys wear green next St. Patrick's Day. Welcome, guys. <laughs> have a good week. Welcome.